welcome to City of Glasgow Ceramic Department. Where applied arts students have the opportunity to study ceramics as part of their course. The students are currently making contemporary work responding to Scotland's historic pottery production for an exhibition of Scotland's industrial potteries. Through this short film, we want to tell you a little bit about Scotland's amazing industrial pottery heritage. Unfortunately, virtually all clues to this once burgeoning industry have been wiped from the built environment. With sherds found on beaches or foundations of new buildings, supplying only a fragmented picture of this once global industry. However, there are a few remaining sites, the final pieces of evidence which hint at the scale, range and global reach of Scotland's pottery industry, which we will discover through the course of this film. Here in the college's kiln room, we continue a Scottish pottery tradition that spanned nearly 250 years. Kicking off in 1748 with the establishment of Deltfield Pottery on the banks of the River Clyde and only coming to an end in 1982 when Govancroft Pottery finally closed its doors. Potteries from the north, east and west of Scotland contributed to Scotland's pottery industry, including Aberdeen, Bowness, Preston Pans, Portobello, Kirkcaldy, Greenock and Glasgow. In the late 19th century, the view from our ceramic studio would have been very different. Nine potteries would have been clearly visible from this site, including the vast Bells, Britannia and Port Dundas potteries, with over 60 of Glasgow's 100 coal kilns producing pottery and pumping thick black smoke into the air. The first and oldest piece of evidence can be found to the west of City of Glasgow College on the banks of the River Kelvin. Sourcing and creating the right blend of ingredients, minerals and clays was essential to the success of the Scottish pottery industry and potteries. The Kelvin Flint Mill or North Woodside Flint Mill can trace its involvement with Scotland's pottery industry back to the Deltfield Pottery, where between 1758 and 1768 it was used for grinding ceramic colours used in painting the delft wood produced by the pottery. It was known then as the Delft Colour Mill at Woodside. The mill, however, is most associated with the Verville Pottery, who owns Kidson, Cochrane and Co. took over the mill in 1846 to grind flint. The flint would have first been burnt in the kiln, the base is which is still standing and mixed with water and ground down using massive grinding stones. The ground flint would have been used to make clay bodies like creamware as well as glazes. This transfer plate was made by Verville Pottery around 1850 and most probably contains flint ground on this exact spot. This impressive building, not far from the Kelvin, may be familiar to you as the old BBC building or further back as Queen Margaret's College, but it is in fact the third piece of evidence signifying the scale and wealth of Scotland's pottery industry. It was built by John and Matthew Bell from the profits of their vast pottery business. The Mighty Bells or Glasgow Pottery Factory was established by the brothers in 1840 and is one of the best known Scottish potteries. The pottery took part in the Great Exhibition at Crystal Palace in 1851 and produced vast amounts of ware for national and international markets, exporting thousands of pieces of pottery worldwide. This beautiful punch bowl made by Bell's Pottery in the 1850s had its own small part to play in the building of this mansion. The 
There is almost no recognition for Scotland's pottery heritage in Glasgow, apart from this humble brick plaque which marks the site of Saracen or Possil pottery. This site produced thousands of pieces of ceramic that were exported from Possil across the globe. Possil or Saracen pottery has a complex and diverse history with an interesting Caribbean twist. Starting out making domestic ware in a variety of earthenware forms from teapots, pitchers and plates, it went on to exhibit at the Glasgow Exhibition of 1888. Subsequently, under the brand name Nautilus, the pottery produced some of the finest porcelain ever produced in Britain. In 1914, as a result of a Cuban thirst for stout produced in stoneware bottles, Tennant's Brewery took over the pottery and began producing a range of stoneware, including beer bottles, hot water bottles, ink jars and even some contemporary ware for London markets. The pottery finally shut its doors in 1942 and was demolished in the late 1980s. This wee stoneware bottle is a humble reminder to the pottery once produced on this site. Far from humble, here, just northeast of Edinburgh City, stand the last remaining buildings of Scotland's pottery industry, one and a half bottle kilns. The kilns were owned by Buchan's Pottery, who produced a range of stoneware in the late 19th century, including whiskey flagons and ginger beer bottles. Standing over 14 metres tall, with a diameter of 10 metres, these kilns would have been packed with hundreds of saggers and required 15 tonnes of coal for each firing. This butterware crock was most probably fired in one of these kilns. Even though the kilns are surrounded by a new housing estate and dislocated from their factory settings, they still stand proud, representing the enormous contribution the pottery industry has made to Scotland's tangible and intangible cultural heritage. Govancroft was the last of Scotland's industrial pottery to be established in 1911, but sadly closed its doors in 1982. It made functional stoneware vessels until 1946 when it decided to expand in ranges and colours. Five modest street signs offer a passing nod to Scotland's final industrial pottery, Potter Path, Potter Lane, Potter Close, Porter Grove and Porter Street. This cup and saucer was part of the Loner range that was produced in 1970 right here to celebrate the 1969 moon landing. <laughs>